In the previous videos, we've been thinking about one locus with two alleles. And so in all of our previous work, we've been really thinking about one locus with two alleles. So what about more? So we know that most traits are in fact the result of a number of different loci and a number of different alleles, right? If you think about your height, it's not just one locus and two alleles that determine how tall you are, it's a number of different loci that are all kind of combining together to result in your height. Instead of thinking about a single locus on a chromosome with two alleles like this, now we'll actually start thinking about two loci on a chromosome, each with two alleles. So when you have a situation like this with two loci, two alleles, it turns out you can actually treat them independently Right? You can worry about this one all by itself, and then worry about this one all by itself, and not worry about how they interact with each other, unless they are linked in some way. Right? Unless there's some sort of relationship between the alleles on these different loci. So what does being linked or not linked mean? Let's think about an individual like this. This individual on this chromosome has a capital A allele and a capital B allele. On the other chromosome, lowercase a lowercase b, when they produce their gametes through meiosis, if there's no recombination, they'll produce these gametes, right? This chromosome will go into the sperm or egg, this chromosome would go into the sperm or egg, and you would get those haplotypes, and at 50% each, right? But that's if there's no recombination, so that means whatever that recombination rate is, if it doesn't happen, that's the proportion of gametes that get those combinations of alleles, and then some of the gametes, if there's recombination, will have those combinations, right? If there's a recombination event here, the capital A cannot be combined with a lowercase b. They're equally likely, but they occur based on the recombination. So these are our, I'll refer to them as recombinants. And if we have no linkage, we would kind of expect this rate of recombination to be 0.5 if you had genetics or if you've had one of the introductory courses that talked about crossing over alleles that are very far from each other or alleles that are on different chromosomes recombine randomly. So now let's look at how linkage can actually be kind of mathematically examined. So let's think about linkage. If we have the frequency of the capital A allele is P, the frequency of the lowercase allele is Q, which we've been using before, and now let's represent the frequency of these alleles with S and T. Now note this S is not anything to do with selection. These are just the letters that are most commonly used for this formulation. What are the frequencies of these haplotypes we would expect to see produced by a population? Um, remember, we're kind of thinking about a panmictic population, so we're not worry about the individuals as much as we're thinking about these haplotypes in a big mixed population. Well, this capital A, capital B haplotype, we would expect it to occur, well, with this proportion, right? So P proportion should be these two. And then of those, S should be this. So we would expect to see in our population a proportion P times S of these haplotypes We'd expect to see P times T, those haplotypes, Q times S, those haplotypes, and Q times T, of those haplotypes. Right. So if we have alleles at those frequencies and there's free recombination, nothing is linked, we would expect to see these frequencies of those haplotypes. And now what we're going to define is we're going to define a value for when we might see something when we might have observed values that are not the same as those four. So the way we're going to calculate that is we're going to define a value d, which we'll call linkage disequilibrium. And this will be the frequency of capital AB haplotypes times the frequency of lowercase a, lowercase b haplotypes, minus the frequency of the other pair haplotypes. And this will be 
something we can calculate based on observed values. Right, so we have some expected values of these haplotypes. We have some observed values. And there might be a mismatch if we have this sort of thing going on. Right? If r is not equal to 0.5, we might end up with frequencies here that don't match this. And we're going to use this equation to examine that. So to remind, our linkage disequilibrium is this. So what's the frequency of this? Well, that was p times s. Frequency of this was q times t. The frequency here was p times t. The frequency there was q times s. So if we multiply those out, we have p s q t minus p s q t. And you would get 0 if all these frequencies of these haplotypes were as expected if there was no linkage. On the other hand, if you have more of these haplotypes than you expect, then that means that first term would be larger, that second term would be smaller, and you would have D is positive. And if you had more of this other set of haplotypes than you expected, then this linkage disequilibrium term would be negative. So we can calculate this capital D term that will let us know whether the haplotype frequencies are as we would expect if there's free recombination and things are not linked, should be 0. If things are linked, we would get values of d that are not equal to zero. So in evolution we're interested in change, so we're not usually so interested in what is the actual linkage of the equilibrium now, but if we're thinking about evolutionary process, we're interested in how does this value of d change. So the new value of d would be whatever the frequency of these haplotypes are in the next generation. Right? From some starting previous generation. And then if you look in your book, the book illustrates pictorially that the new frequency of, for example, this haplotype will be that old frequency of the haplotype minus the amount of it that recombines, and then you have to take into account the linkage disequilibrium that's plugged in there. That takes into account recombination that reduces this, and then recombination of the other haplotypes that would create this. Um, and that goes in there. And similarly, we have kind of analogous equations for the other four haplotypes. And if we take and plug all these in to here and do some algebra, we end up getting a result that the new value of linkage disequilibrium ends up simplifying down to the old value minus the rate of recombination times the old value. So that's d1 minus r. Now the interesting thing about this is it tells us that if we have linkage disequilibrium, if we have a non-random association between the alleles and these different loci, right? if those frequencies of the haplotypes are not as we expect from just the frequencies of the alleles, then even if we have full recombination, right? so this rate of recombination is 0.5, even if we had that, at most 
the next value of length of statistical equilibrium is half of the previous one. So free recombination isn't going to immediately get rid of linkage to equilibrium in one generation. It's going to take it a little while. So we can make a little plot here of linkage to equilibrium. If you had a population that had high levels of linkage to equilibrium at the beginning, for whatever reason, each generation, it's only going to be reduced by half at the most, and it'll be reduced more slowly if the rate of recombination is anything less than a half. So you'd actually have kind of an exponential decay down to there. And if you had Lincoln's disequilibrium um, given by a negative value, you'd have the same sort of thing here. So even if you have full recombination, you don't get rid of Lincoln's disequilibrium right away. So the first result of this is that recombination doesn't immediately eliminate linkage disequilibrium. This LD is when you have a value of linkage disequilibrium here that's not equal to zero. And that means that physically non-linked loci retain linkage disequilibrium for a time, right? So even, even alleles that are on loci that are on different chromosomes and there's total free recombination, if linkage disequilibrium builds up, it will remain for a number of generations, that pattern will persist. And the paper that you're um, reading at the end of the semester uses this information, shows how linkage persisting can actually reveal information, can be used to understand the evolutionary history of a group. If you have a group that gets some linkage disequilibrium into it for some reason, then that persistence over a long period of time, even at a later point, if you can measure that linkage disequilibrium, you can actually infer that this occurred. And inferring that that occurred can actually tell you something about the history of a group. And this paper here that you're reading at the end of the course shows how them looking at linkage disequilibrium allows them to understand something about recent human evolution, in particular the migration of humans out of Africa.